Good afternoon, all. It is my immense pleasure to take this opportunity to welcome you all here today for the International Guest Lecture Program, which is organized by the Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Sri Jayawardenepura, to provide a platform for renowned intellectuals and emerging scholars in the world to exchange and share their experiences and research on all aspects of multidisciplinary studies. So today we have invited one of the prominent scholars in the field of archaeology to enlighten us with his valuable ideas and thoughts. Dr. Patrick Faulkner from the University of Sydney joined with us virtually and he will conduct his lecture under the title Rainforest and Coast, a new project on the archaeology and archaeomalacology of southern Sri Lanka. Before starting our lecture, let me give you a brief introduction of our resource person. Dr. Patrick Faulkner is a senior lecturer in archaeology at the University of Sydney since 2014, having previously held a teaching and research position 2007 to 2013 at the University of Queensland. He completed his PhD at the Australian National University in 2006, focused on the investigation of late Holocene coastal economies in Northern Australia. He has been an affiliated researcher with the Department of Archaeology, Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History since 2017. Dr. Faulkner is interested in past human environment interactions, having undertaken research across the coasts and islands of the Indo Pacific as well as around inland aquatic environments. He has undertaken research across the Australian tropics as well as contributing to research projects in Papua New Guinea, Eastern Africa, and more recently, Sri Lanka. He is a specialist in archaeomalacology, coastal paleoeconomies, zooarchaeology, and taphonomy human ecology. Human environment interactions and technology are some of his research interests. So we are very fortunate to have you here today as our resource person to conduct this discourse. Without taking much time, I cordially invite Dr. Patrick Faulkner to continue the session. So dear participants, kindly mute yourselves. And if you have any concerns or questions, please use your raise hand option. Also, we are giving time for the discussion at the end of the lecture. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to, um, to deliver this talk for everyone today. And I'd especially like to thank Professor Patmalal for the invitation and to the um, Faculty of Graduate Studies for, for hosting the talk as well. I'll just share my screen. So what I want to present today really relates to a, a project that we've just commenced here in Sri Lanka. Um, this was a project that we started developing quite a long time ago now, uh, in 2017, uh, and we, we had the funding awarded for, for the project in 2020, but deferred the commencement due to the international COVID situation. So I thought it would be a really good opportunity to be able to talk about what the project is going to, to try and achieve, what we're aiming to do, the kinds of questions that we're trying to address and the methods that we'll be using to address those questions. Uh, I should also mention that the project is funded by the Australian Research Council under a future fellowship uh, and the, the research will be undertaken in close collaboration with uh, the University of Sri Jayawardenepura particularly with Dr. Oshan Verigi, uh, with Professor Patmalal, Professor Alexander, as well as Professor Manatunga from the uh, Department of Archaeology. When we were developing the project, one of the things that really kind of stood out for me in terms of how we think about human engagement or human interaction with the environments in which they live is essentially how humans adapt and how they've continued to adapt for a really long period of time. And this quote comes from a, a publication uh, by Robertson Stewart in 2018. Really, the, the quote, which is on the screen, 
is about looking at the way humans have evolved, the way humans adapt to different kinds of, of ecosystems and how that runs in parallel essentially with cultural evolution. So in essence, if we're going to, to think about elements of human behaviour, so human technology, subsistence and diet, how humans communicate with each other, and also potentially changes in paleodemography. So thinking about population size and composition, we need to be able to embed those kinds of issues within a strong understanding of environmental structure. And particularly thinking about the long-term dynamic environmental changes that we see across the world um, from the, the movement of our species out of Africa um, and into places like Sri Lanka and then further afield into Australasia. One of the, the real hallmarks, I think, of, of our species of Homo sapiens is our ability to, to adapt. How we can change the way we behave, how we can adapt elements of our behavioural systems to suit new and changing environmental conditions. When we can track those kinds of changes, we can then start to get a really detailed picture broadly of human evolution, but really understanding where we are now and how we got here. So the goals of the, of the project um, that we're, we're running for the next four years here in Sri Lanka is really focusing on past human behaviour from about 48,000 years ago to the present based on, on the, the archaeological evidence that we have available to us now. Really linking that evidence to understanding broad spectrum dietary shifts. And by that, I mean changes in terms of the expansion of the dietary components in different parts of, of Sri Lanka through time and space. Trying to understand elements of seasonality, the way people use the landscape, how they were mobile potentially at different times of the year, um, and then trying to link that through to issues to do with population size as well. So hopefully what we'll be able to, to achieve at the, the end of the project, um, we've got a series of, of, of research goals that link to these kinds of issues. Really focusing in on, on Sri Lanka from 48,000 to 2,000 years ago to try and get a more comprehensive, overarching and holistic understanding of, of past human economies here. And within these economic strategies, we're thinking about diet and technology. From that kind of characterization, trying to narrow down our understanding of long-term trends as well as short-term fluctuations in human behaviour and how those trends can contribute to either change or stability in socioeconomic structures and how they can link to broader environmental processes. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the... the the key things that we really wanted to do in setting up this project was to try and get an understanding of human occupation and behaviour in different kinds of, of eco zones around the country. So looking at diverse landscapes and how they might influence uh, elements of, of occupation intensity as well as economic structure then feeding into to trying to get an understanding of mobility and population size. And ultimately, one of the goals that, for me personally, I would like to, to try and push through either at the end of this project or something that we can build on in the development of further collaborative research is how we can use the archaeological evidence to feed into modern-day issues particularly where we've got significant human impacts on different kinds of, of ecosystems around the world, and particularly in, in Sri Lanka. So modelling these long-term patterns for, for rainforests, 
for the intermediate zone, for the dry uplands, and then down to the south coast, hopefully will then allow us to contribute to discussions about resource management, um, ecosystem management and conservation, and also understanding the impacts and the potential ongoing impacts of environmental and climatic change. <coughs> Excuse me. So given the kind of work that I've done in different parts of the world over the last 15 to 20 years, I guess the question that, that comes up more often than anything else as we were developing this project is, is why Sri Lanka? Why would we want to undertake this kind of research here? And Sri Lanka is really pivotal in terms of our understanding of long-term elements of, of human adaptation and human dispersals. Sri Lanka sits about halfway between Africa as the origin of our species and Southeast Asia and Australasia. And in a lot of ways, Sri Lanka is slightly different to, well, it presents slightly different evidence to what we would expect based on what we see archaeologically within India and also archaeologically within Southeast Asia and Australia. We can cross out greater than 38,000 years ago and provide a, a more definitive age of 48,000 for humans within Sri Lanka. But as the halfway point, as people were crossing really, really diverse and dynamic environments coming into this area in South Asia, how can we then use this information to create a greater understanding of further human movement through into Southeast Asia, the Wallacean Archipelago, and then ultimately into Australasia? With occupation here in, in Australia dating back to 65,000 years ago, unfortunately, the, the nature of the evidence that we have throughout this key area of Southeast Asia, these mainly in Southeast Asia to Australasia, is actually quite minimal. So using Sri Lanka and the dynamic and diverse ecosystems that occur here, we can then try to, to model elements of, of human dispersal, occupation and resource use through this area to then provide us with an indication of where we can start to look to fill in some of those gaps in the evidence. So it's, it's centrally, geographically and conceptually Sri Lanka is a really key area for these big picture understandings of, of human dispersal and uh, evolution and adaptation. Outside of Sri Lanka, the, the kind of archaeology that I guess is, is better known really relates to more the more recent period, um, really looking at the, the historical period where we're getting the, the development of, of urbanism and agriculture and monumental architecture. But I was much more influenced by Dr. Siran Duraniagala in developing a lot of these ideas. Um, my work has been more firmly in, embedded within prehistory for several decades anyway. And a lot of the discussions that I had with Dr. Duraniagala during the developmental phases of this project and in discussion with many other colleagues here in, in Sri Lanka, we could really use his foundational prehistory of Sri Lanka, which is still really the most comprehensive text on early occupation and prehistoric archaeology in Sri Lanka now using the, the kinds of, of ideas that he developed and presented within his work relative to the sorts of environmental structures, these eco-zones that he used as a, as a, a structure to developing, I guess, the, the further development of prehistoric archaeology within, within Sri Lanka. So his work and discussions with him several years ago were really pivotal to thinking about these ideas relative to what was happening in other parts of the world through similar kinds of, of timeframes. I also was quite lucky as an affiliate with Max Planck to start collaborating with Dr. Roshan in 2017. Uh, and this is 
obviously him here in the centre of this picture. Um, we've been close collaborator for quite a few years of this project while we were both at Max Planck in Jena in Germany. And then over the subsequent years, So as well as, as Siran's work, it was really looking at the more recent prehistoric archaeological research that people like Oshan was developing as part of his PhD. Really pivotal research in terms of furthering our, our understanding of, of early use, early human use of, of rainforests in this part of the world that then sort of pushed a lot of those ideas in combination through to, to the formulation of the project as we have it now. <coughs> so what I thought I would do uh, initially within the, within the talk was to just talk about a small number of the study sites that we're going to be using. I'll just bring that up. Um, so we'll be mostly focusing on the analysis and reanalysis of existing archaeological assemblages with some minimal excavation um, to supplement that, that material. In terms of the, the archaeomalacology or the, the analysis of uh, shell, molluscan material recovered from archaeological sites, when we look at archaeomalacology in other parts of the world, it's quite well developed in places like Europe, in North America, and in South Africa. Then we, we get minimal development, uh, minimal emphasis on the exploration of, of these kinds of materials in other parts of the world. And that includes Sri Lanka. So this gives us a, a niche. It gives us a gap um, in terms of the kind of materials that have been analysed in detail here. And we can start to use the, the mollus to, to fill in and to add to the existing research. So we selected eight sites to start with, um, three distributed within the, the, um, the wet zone, uh, covering mostly the uplands in this area here, two sites, key sites within the, the intermediate zone, okay, and one site uh, over in the, the arid uplands, or the dry uplands, uh, and two sites to start with, we selected for the, the semi-arid lowlands. And the idea behind this was to give us a, a cross-section of these key environmental zones across the southern half of Sri Lanka, knowing that there had been really detailed, really systematic excavation um, in the vast majority of these sites, that would analyze to investigate, to add to that body of knowledge that already exists. Briefly, just as, as sort of a part of the, the uh, how how we're thinking about approaching these sites and then how we're going to do it sort of um, moving forward with the project. The first site I'll talk about is uh, Fahim. So obviously this is one of the sites that Oshan is really interesting because of the, the time depth that we have associated with occupation of this site, and in particular um, with his collaborations with a number of, of international researchers that really push the antiquity, the, the chronology of this site back to 48,000 years ago. So. Fahian is really one of the key sites for us to investigate when looking at the molluscan material for, for Sri Lanka. Just a couple of photographs of the site. I'm sure that everybody is, is familiar with uh, this material and, and this site based on the work that Oshan developed and has published um, over the last couple of years. Quite an extensive cave site with excellent depth of deposit and high resolution um, stratigraphic information available from this site based on around the world. And we can see that here in the, the photograph of the stratigraphic section, okay, where all of these, these layers, really complex 
uh, and fine stratigraphy uh, that builds up based on the quality of the work that's been undertaken at this site to give us a really high resolution sequence to work with for the molluscan material. And this is a, 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 an image that is uh, that was published in, in one of Oshan's publications in 2019 um, that shows the, the stratigraphic section drawing and the associated radiocarbon dates. So pushing us back in terms of the chronology of occupation here, as I said, to about 48,000, but with a, a really nice sort of late Pleistocene, terminal Pleistocene, um, and then sort of early to mid Holocene sequence for this site. And we can separate this deposit into four main phases based on the, the uh, chronostratigraphic uh, research that has been undertaken at 4,000. Phase C is a terminal Pleistocene um, deposit from 13 to 12,000. Phase B, 8,700 to 8,000 years ago. And phase A from approximately six to, to 4,000 years ago. So we've got a, a punctuated um, occupational sequence. Okay, so people are here at different periods of time in terms of the occupation of, of the site. And this allows us to tap into really kind of key periods um, in terms of as human behavioural strategies to potentially localise climatic changes. What's really interested, I think, everybody over the last couple of years with, with this side is the, the really detailed vertebrate faunal analyses that have been undertaken and published, where it's been clearly demonstrated that people who are occupying the rainforest and occupying this site were focused very heavily on the, the hunting and the exploitation of, of primates, of monkeys that were living up in the rainforest canopy. So that really required a, a high level of technological investment um, and strategic thinking for people to be able to exploit these kinds of animals, especially being on the ground and hunting these animals up in, you know, up in the canopy. <coughs> and a really good sort of detailed sequence that covers all of those phases, late Pleistocene through to mid Holocene. One of the questions that's always sort of come to my mind in, in looking at this kind of material is the degree of risk that is associated with hunting small animals well above the ground. And in that sense, it may be, as a, as a hypothesis, that to alleviate that degree of, of risk, um, people were accessing and exploiting plant foods as well as the, the terrestrial and freshwater snails from these environments as well. And that's one of the things that we'll actually kind of look at testing um, in analysing the molluscan material from this site. Some really kind of awesome material culture that has been recovered from this deposit as well. Um, worked bone, uh, so bone points for the hunting of monkeys made from monkey bone. Um, the modification of, of teeth um, as well as long bones. And this illustration here just shows that, I guess, degree of complexity in how people would have had to have approached those kinds of hunting strategies. Okay, using something like a bow and arrow to then shoot up into the canopy okay, at the right angle with the right amount of, of velocity to be able to bring a small animal like this down. Uh, this figure just shows the, the breakdown again in, in terms of the, the number of, of primates um, per 100 years. Uh, and this is a bit of a sort of an artificial construct in some ways because we've got a portion of the deposit excavated um, and assigning minimum numbers of individuals through to a, a chronological structure like 100-year periods um, doesn't necessarily kind of show the 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 sheer amount of, of animals that were actually kind of being hunted and consumed, um, but it just gives an indication of potentially 
relative levels of ex exploitation. Um, and then we can start to compare these kinds of data sets with looking at the, the degree of, of exploitation intensity of these um, terrestrial forest dwelling land snails, the acarvidae, as well as the, the paludomus that come from flowing, clean, clear freshwater streams and how these might actually be changing through time. That will allow us to look at the potential broad spectrum of resources that people are accessing from this site within the rainforest zone. And a similar kind of picture we can develop with um, the, the Batadombalena uh, assemblages as well. Um, this site was excavated last by Nimal Pereira, Dr. Nimal Pereira, um, about 10, 15 years ago now from memory. Um, again, quite a big cave site with depth of deposit in the, the wet uplands. Um, and again, a very complex stratigraphic sequence. This site can again be sort of allocated in terms of analytical and chronological units to several main phases, uh, really where we're looking at late Pleistocene, 36,000, in this case for, for Batadomba, through to about 8,800. Okay, another layer that dates from 8,800 to 16,800. Okay, layer five and layer four, extending those chronologies. Um, but with the, the main part of the, the deposit, really sort of in terms of the assemblages that are available to us, finishing by about the terminal Pleistocene. The important thing in using multiple sites for, for this kind of excavation is the variation in the chronology of occupation around the, the rainforest in particular. So where we can start to look at regional sequences by filling in critical gaps in the chronology using multiple sites. Similar kinds of, of vertebrate fall analyses um, have been presented for, for Batadombalena, where there's a predominance of arboreal monkeys, as well as things like civets and squirrels uh, being hunted, um, and very small forest dwelling animals as well occurring within, within these sites. Um, large things like large animals like deer um, are a minor representation, and that's probably to do with the, the ecosystem structure itself. Batadomba has, in terms of the publications, probably one of the more detailed um, invertebrate or molluscan analyses presented so far. But this is a very, very small subsample of the overall uh, molluscan assemblage available to us. So we can see that there's a carvus, other terrestrial uh, snails like Oligospira, um, as well as freshwater mollusks like Paludomus and Pila. One of the really interesting things about this sequence is we get uh, a shift in the taxonomic representation. So around about 16,000 years ago, we get a change from the foraging and the, the acquisition of arboreal forest dwelling gastropods around the site, things like the acarvus, to aquatic taxa like Paludomus. So that's kind of interesting because it raises questions about whether we're seeing localised changes to environmental conditions. Maybe we're seeing an, an increase in, in rainfall and water runoff in these catchment systems. Or it could be a shift in preference, a behavioural change in terms of the dietary acquisition of these species. Um, in some sort of logistical fashion. If, if people are moving to different parts of the landscape within the fresh, and as a result, they're starting to, to gather more of the, the fresh water mollusks. So that would be something that we would be hoping to, to also kind of test those sorts of ideas and see if this change from terrestrial and arboreal to freshwater mollusks is replicated in other sites within the region. The other, the other thing that's, that's kind of interesting, I think, is the, the potential for, for shell technology. 
which we do see in other parts of the world as well, and which has been recorded within Sri Lanka, um, within the, the rainforest zone. Um, the image on the bottom right is not from Batadomba, but it's from, from Fahian. Um, so this is one that I recorded with Oshan in 2017, where we've got intentional perforation of the body well of these, um, these sort of terrestrial or arboreal gastropods. Um, these may have been then used for, for processing of, of plant material. Um, but interestingly, we've got pigmentation apparent on this specimen on the left in particular. So using ochre to colour the shell for some reason. So we'll be looking to, to see if we're getting much evidence for, for clear human modification um, as, a, as a form of utilitarian technology for, for daily use, for cutting and scraping, or if we're getting evidence for ornamentation, some kind of symbolic incorporation of the local Molluscan taxa into these populations. So there are a couple of issues here. I think that we'll be trying to address, I think primarily the, the biggest issue for us is looking at whether we're getting relative stability or change in environmental and climatic conditions in the, in the wet zone. <clears throat> Are we getting fluctuations over this long period of time from 48,000 years ago through to the, I guess, the relatively more recent past at about 2,000 years ago? And how can we actually track those localised climatic shifts? Are those potential changes influencing differences in, in human behaviour, particularly that, that change at 16,000 years ago that we see from arboreal mollusks to the, the freshwater? Is that influenced by changes in human mobility and settlement strategies within this broad area? So there's some big questions here that we're aiming to address. As a component of that too, we've got excellent vertebrate faunal information. What can the invertebrates tell us about potential broad spectrum diets within this region as well? And from that point, we can then start to also look at the, the southern coast. <clears throat> Fortunately, there's a couple of sites that are available to us, again, with excellent excavation techniques, high-resolution recovery, um, and again, largely influenced in terms of the selection of, of one site in particular through discussion with Dr. Duraniagala and Oshan. The first site that I'll talk about for the southern coast, which is a, a semi-arid region, uh, is Bundala. And this is one site that Siran excavated, dated, and discussed quite a lot in his foundational prehistory of Sri Lanka. And more recent excavations um, by Oshan in collaboration with our researchers from Max Planck, as well as other international institutions. There's a whole range of reasons why this site is important, um, particularly with the distribution of lithic materials deep into, into this sequence. Um, that's really not something that I'll, I'll talk about today for, for our purposes. That's another issue. Um, there's potentially occupation going back to 74, 75,000 years ago based on therm thermoluminescence dating. But the, the stratigraphic unit, the layer that I'm most interested in, in looking at dates to about 5,000 years ago. Um, which is a very dense shell deposit. And the interesting thing about Bundala is that this site sits very high up off the, the modern coast and modern sea levels, um, somewhere in the order of about 20 to 30 metres above the, above the coastline. So this is a, a really interesting site for us to be thinking about as a, as a part of this, this project. Um, some photos here provided by Oshan um, of the, the more recent excavations showing that really dense shell layer uh, in the upper part of the, the deep excavation pit that we can see here. Um, and another photo on the top right showing the base of that unit. So it's been excavated and then coming down to, to the area below. 
And what we're seeing from a, a, a preliminary series of, of analyses undertaken on the shell deposit is that it's dominated by one species, um, which is a, an estuarine or lagoonal bivalve, Meritrix castor. Uh, and this species, this taxon, dominates most of the shell deposits across this region of the southern coast of Sri Lanka. Interestingly, with, with this region, um, there has been a lot of discussion over the last 10 to 20 years about the origin of these deposits. Um, lots of discussion about the shell deposits being natural formations um, through high energy sort of coastal processes. Um, also discussions about relative sea levels and how that has influenced the deposition of all of the sites, primarily across the southern coast. From 1995, the sea level curve that was generated for, for this broader region shows a high stand from about 7,000 years ago with some fluctuations sitting at around about five metres-ish above present with fluctuations from that. We, when we look at some of the, the shell deposits situated in and around um, places like Palimala down on the southern coast, it's pretty clear to, to our minds that many of these are natural. Um, when we compare those with what we see at Bundala, which sits so high above modern sea levels, it's very difficult to make an argument for that being natural based on those kinds of, of pro natural processes alone. What we do see in a number of these places are very dense shell deposits. Investigations around the world have indicated that these can be Chenia features, um, naturally deposited material from the near shore into tidal zone up onto, up onto the land. Um, I would argue that there needs to be much more detailed focused investigation of these potential sites. Um, basically, individually, they need to be investigated. Okay, we can't apply a broad scale assumption of, of natural origin or cultural origin across this area. Each site needs to be taken at its own merit and investigated based on pretty detailed criteria. So what we see here around Palimala are what I would, I would say would be natural deposits, very thin lenses of, of shell material with high degrees of, of fragmentation within these environments, contrasted with what we see at, at Bundala within that site excavation, which is a, a very discrete um, shell deposit. The preliminary analyses that we've undertaken on the bundle of material, um, two one by one metre squares we, we looked at in detail. Um, the results so far being over 126,000 individuals contributing to, to those two one by one metre squares, dominated by meritrix, meritrix castor, as I mentioned, at about 95%, with small numbers of small marine gastropods and small numbers of other bivalve taxa um, that look to come from the same family as Meritrix, but are likely to be a different species. Um, we need to clarify that with a little bit more research, but I'm leaning more towards taxa that probably inhabit sandy environments rather than lagoonal for this. But what we don't see within, within this site is a high degree of shell fragmentation. We don't see a high degree of shell modification that would relate to natural high energy processes of, of deposition. We don't see a, a lot of taxa that would be picked up from the intertidal zone that we don't see within cultural deposits and dumped, or things like coral and pumice and other sorts of, of, of rocks and debris that would be dumped as a part of that process as well. A bit more work that needs to be done to, to clarify a number of these questions, but Bundle is going to be key to thinking about those issues. 
<clears throat> excuse me. All right, just keeping on the time. All right, so I'll try and finish up within the, the next 10 minutes to leave some time for, for questions. Uh, Mini Atelier is another site that we'll, we will analyse. Um, initially, we were thinking about re-excavation, but the material is available for us to, to look at. Um, this site was disturbed by shell mining um, for lime production um, a few years ago now. Uh, so that was followed by a salvage excavation by the Department of Archaeology. And it's situated not far from, from Bundala. Different kind of, of environmental context. Um, the site's located underneath a, a modern day rice field, but really dense shell deposits within this area. So this is one of the locations <coughs> where these sorts of materials, these kinds of deposits have been assumed to be entirely natural. Okay. Within this, this sequence, there's cultural material, there are human burials. Uh, and looking at the, the photographs of the, the section, the excavated section, multiple shell deposits, multiple layers within this site as well. It may be that we are, we could be looking at a combination of, of natural deposits down below with cultural deposits over the top. And that's something that we will uh, address in the, the detailed analyses of the mini atelier material. And this is what the area looks like now. Okay, so it's, it's actually relatively low lying, but the, the, the mini atelier site sits on a slight rise okay, that overlooks the, the, the rice fields. Um, with a, a bit of modelling of, of sea level fluctuations, we'll be able to determine just how far above the potential maximum sea level high stand this site would have sat. Okay, I'll skip over that. Oh, sorry, the, the top layer of the, the midden deposit, what I think is a shell midden deposit, dates to about 4,000 years ago. So that gives us a, a nice comparison with Bundula at 5,000 years ago as well. Uh, interestingly, um, the burials within this site um, were recovered uh, in flex position, minimal disturbance uh, following the, the interment of, of this individual, as we can see here. Um, so this burial recovered it in a block, um, then investigated uh, and now sits uh, in the museum in Gaul. All of the material that I've seen in and around that burial uh, in the museum is the same taxon that we see at Bundala as well. So there's regional continuity in the, the primary species being deposited, but mini atelier is really interesting because there's a range of other taxa that we just don't see at Bundala. And that may reflect access to different kinds of, of ecosystems or habitats close to, close to this site, particularly things like these mudflat uh, bivalves over here on the left-hand side, um, oysters, um, which are attached to, to, to rocks or mangroves, freshwater gastropods, uh, and these marine gastropods, uh, turbinella or turbinellum, um, that are also prevalent within the intertidal site. So a bit more diversity within this site, which will uh, prove to be an interesting comparison. Okay, so again, a number of issues here, primarily thinking about natural versus cultural origin for these deposits and how we can address uh, a clear identification uh, and clear criteria for identification of the origin of, of these sites. And then from there, starting to, to look at modelling use of the intertidal zone by humans during the, the mid-Holocene in this area and how that relates potentially to fluctuations in sea levels as well as other localised environmental and climatic shifts occurring within this area. Okay, so broadly, as I mentioned earlier, this is the distribution of study sites that we're looking at primarily for the core of the project, um, but we're also hoping to add in a number of other assemblages from sites distributed across the, the southern half of Sri Lanka where we can to start filling in those geographic and chronological gaps. Briefly, just in the next 
five minutes or so, um, I'll just touch on the, the kind of methods that we're going to apply, um, just as a, as a very broad overview. The, the initial core of the analyses will be based on taxonomic identification, taphonomic assessment of the shell assemblages, and potentially some biometric assessment of these materials as well. So looking at a clear species identification where we know we've got morphological overlap and morphological plasticity for a number of these deposits, um, that's going to be difficult to address for some of the less studied species that occur within sites within Sri Lanka. Um, and in, that, in this sense, we'll be collaborating very closely with um, Dr. Dinazar Rahim um, as an expert, particularly on the, the terrestrial Malacca fauna within this region. The taphonomic assessment will be looking at things like shell condition um, to differentiate natural versus cultural processes, particularly trying to, to look at the prevalence and distribution of ornamental materials, like we see here from Batadombalena, uh, with modification of, of this shell, um, and the uh, land snail modification that I showed you a little bit earlier, but also looking at transportation of marine taxa into, into the uplands, which Oshan demonstrated really clearly with a, a shell bead, a marine shell bead dating to about 48,000. Yeah, 48,000. So that's really interesting because that's early transportation of marine material for a symbolic purpose. The biometric assessment will depend largely on how much, how much material of, of a modern sample that was particularly poor English, but how big a modern sample of each species we can, we can acquire. Um, but we'll also do some biometric assessment of the, of the archaeological material to look at potential changes in size and shape through time and whether they might relate to climatic change or variations in the intensity of human predation. To supplement or to, sorry, to support those analyses, we'll be doing ecological surveys in and around key sites um, in each of those, those ecological zones um, with modern specimen collection to look at the, the degree of richness and diversity in the contemporary distribution of, of species around these areas now. That will then serve as a, as a baseline for comparison with the archeological evidence and how that might actually be changing through time, knowing that we've got some cultural selection, um, so a direct one-to-one -one comparison of richness and diversity from the archaeological assemblages isn't really feasible with the modern, but we can then use that data to look at tracking potential changes to, to local ecosystems. These modern specimen collections will also form the basis um, for other analytical methods like um, oxygen, oxygen isotopes, um, looking at shell elemental analyses, as well as things like amino acid racemization as a relative dating method to, to clarify depositional episodes within these sites. So that's where the AAR, the amino acid racemization, comes in. In most of these sites, we've got good chronology in terms of the occupational phases, but that doesn't tell us about depositional events within these phases themselves. Using amino acid racemization, we can start to, to package up context, so archaeological context within these, these um, broad chronological phases. And this is what has been done pretty successfully within Australian um, archaeological research as well. Uh, so we can start to, to group together contexts or separate them out based on the, the results of the amino acid racemization analyses. So it won't give us exact dates in the way that we're using this technique, but it will allow us to determine depositional phases and depositional units within the broader chronological phases that have been determined for each deposit. 
And a key thing, as I've mentioned a couple of times um, over the course of the talk, is looking at seasonality and, and environmental conditions. This is a little tricky in terms of applying oxygen isotopes in particular. Uh, well established for a range of, of different taxa, molluscan fauna around the world. Uh, it's not been applied systematically um, within archaeological research in Sri Lanka so far. Um, so we're really trying to, to use some of these methods to, to push ahead um, to sort of really bring this, this kind of understanding in line with, with global archaeological research and apply these methods to a range of, of different taxa, um, marine, freshwater, estuarine, and terrestrial. And each kind of habitat, broad habitat zone that these mollusks come from bring some difficulties or challenges in how we apply the, the stable isotopes. But we've put together a, a team of experts from, from Germany, from England, and from Spain to really sort of narrow down the, the efficiency um, and the reliability of the, the oxygen isotopes for the Sri Lankan fauna. We'll use sclerochronology as well to help us look at elements of, of seasonality based on the, the modern specimen collections as a, as a baseline. Um, so then we can actually kind of track season of death for the dominant taxa within these deposits and use those data to then also think about the, the application of um, oxygen isotope sampling throughout these layers within the shell as well. And shell elemental analysis, which has been applied to several archaeological sites and a number of different marine taxa, um, particularly in places like Saudi Arabia um, and more recently within parts of, of Europe, has been shown to be quite effective where things like the, the stable oxygen isotopes may not be providing robust or clear indications in terms of things like seasonality and or environmental conditions. Doing these elemental analyses in combination with the, the, the isotopes can give us more options in terms of, of trying to disentangle some of those processes. This is not something that I'm an expert in, uh, this is not my area of, of research, but this is why we have put together that team of, of international researchers to, to really help us push this side of the, the project forward. Okay, so finally thinking about the implications for, for what we're trying to get, get out of the project. These slides just show those sort of broad aims and questions that are, that are highlighted at the, at the start of the talk. Really, when we put a lot of this material together, what we should be able to get out of the, out of the project is a, a very detailed, high-resolution understanding of human behaviours across multiple ecosystems and ecological zones within Sri Lanka. We can then tie those elements to an understanding of environmental and climatic changes in a broad sense, Okay, with some of the existing paleoenvironmental research that's, that has been undertaken and is currently being undertaken within Sri Lanka, using the, the kinds of analyses that I've just briefly mentioned to have a, a bottom-up approach to looking at local climatic and regional climatic conditions and then connecting those to possible changes or, or variations in human behaviour or stability in human behaviour. Okay, that then allows us to look at broad spectrum economic structures. There's often an assumption in other parts of the world that people don't diversify their, their diet or their economies unless they're forced to. I'm not necessarily convinced that's the case. I think a diverse subsistence or economic strategy provides a high degree of flexibility and adaptability. Um, and allows people to minimise risk within particular kinds of environmental conditions. So that's where a lot of these issues come in. <clears throat> and I think irrespective of the way the, the data comes in and the analyses flow, we're going to be able to contribute to those discussions in a really critical way. And finally, as we work towards the, the end of the project um, in, at the end of 2025, 
trying to, to really feed some of this information into broader scale understandings of current ecosystems and how we can actually manage those. And I think we'll be able to do that quite clearly through the, the archaeological material in combination with the, the modern ecological surveys. Just like to acknowledge all of the people on the screen here who contributed to the development of this project and a lot of these ideas. In particular, um, the, the team of collaborators here in Sri Lanka, um, Dr. Sirandra Aniagala, who was just pivotal to the development of these ideas. Um, Oshan Vedegi, uh, who's been a long-term friend and collaborator. Um, Professor Patmalau, Professor Alexander, uh, at the University of Sri Jaya Warden Pura for, for their collaboration and support. Professor Maratunga at the, the Department of Archaeology and Dr. Pereira and Dr. Rizat Rahim. Okay. I will leave that there. I'll stop sharing and happy to take questions if there's any time. Sorry, I ran a little bit over time with that. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Patrick. Uh, <clears throat> Patrick, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very uh, descriptive, uh, uh, clear presentation. Uh, so then it is not a question, just I want to know. So this is a very big project. So then I also uh, collaborate for the project. Yep. So then in the future, uh, because uh, the, then we need uh, to train young scientists. So then uh, what is the location? in this project to train young scientists in Sri Lanka. That is a very important, it is not a question. So then if you can uh, provide uh, this facility in near future, the Faculty of Graduate Studies can organize uh, uh, any type of workshop, uh, the support with your institute and other collaborators uh, to, uh, to aware and to, to train our uh, young, I mean the researchers. Yeah. Do, do you mind if I say something uh, about that? It's it's something that we've talked about that we've talked about quite a lot. Um, that the the team of collaborators in Sri Lanka have, have talked about quite a lot, and it was it was an issue that Dr. Durani Agala was very strong on in the early discussions of the project as well. Is that the project needs to bring something back to Sri Lanka, um, that it needs to help facilitate the training of Sri Lankan archaeologists. So each year we'll run, the idea would be to run a series of, of workshops um, to, to work through project material, to work through issues of, of analysis, um, the kind of methods that we'll be applying um, it, you know, I, I would say at least one good detailed workshop each year for, for, for students um, as well as staff. Um, we also will run a more formal workshop for postgraduate students next year. Um, and I would bring over one of the isotopic specialists um, to assist with that, that workshop as well to talk about the kind of work that he does because it's not a, a, an area of expertise of, of mine, I thought it would be good to have that kind of analytical focus come into a workshop as well. Um, and then running kind of talks and, and symposiums. So we can then sort of build a bit of critical mass based on this project for these kinds of, of analyses, this kind of archeology span um, and hopefully then bring more people through into, into prehistoric archaeology and, and paleoeconomic and paleoecological research. That would be the idea. Yeah. So as a zoologist, so the attached to the Department of Zoology, so then we have actually included uh, the most of uh, the what you have presented today to our curricula. So then the, the, during the first year, the, all students, so then who registered for zoology. So they studied about uh, the evolution and the, the then basics uh, of evolution, 
and the fossils and the how fossils forms and the fossil dating and all the shells and other things. So therefore, and the different methods theoretical, but uh, I know so then they don't uh, get any field exposure or any type of training. So therefore, then if we can provide this type of I mean uh, hands-on training or any I mean the, the training um, in in house or outside training, so then we can attract uh, very good. I mean, uh, very talented students to this field. So that is, I mean, it's very important. Now we are not following the traditional methods and other things. So then we are now, I mean, the, the moving to very more modern methods, the fossil dating and carbon and uh, isotopes and other things. So they are very good knowledge with the chemistry. So therefore, uh, I think uh, it is very important to explore so all these students uh, to get some knowledge and then they can, uh, I mean, uh, change their dire direction in the future research. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, then thank you, Pat. Uh, so the, it is a short time. So then I invited you to do a presentation. So in future, uh, so then we work together as a collaborators and very, very closely. Uh, and also I would like to tell all today who I mean join with us. So we have already uh, uh, finalized the sites for the study, and then uh, then we will uh, then uh, the pet may I mean the leave from the country uh, during the his absence. So then we we work all the paperwork and the, uh, all the clearance from the different institutes and departments, and we prepare for the groundwork. Um, so once I mean the, he has planned to come again. Uh, to do some work. So then in this time also, uh, I hope to have a good, uh, I mean, the workshop for present day, uh, I mean, a good presentation physically uh, to our um, undergraduates and postgraduate students. So unfortunately today, uh, physically we couldn't uh, meet, uh, but anyway, uh, so the, our staff uh, were able to, I mean, uh, prepare this as a YouTube uh, bros, uh, live bro, bros, uh, bro, uh, broadcasting uh, program. Uh, so then anybody can, uh, I mean, the download and they, they, the people can, I mean, understand and they can repeatedly learn uh, uh, the, something from your presentation. Perfect. So thank you very much for your support and very, I mean, the descriptive presentation. And we hope your support and academic support and the practical support uh, in your, I mean, the, the, during the project and uh, the further uh, to the University of Sri Jayavarman. Thank you. And then, Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Kanishka uh, will uh, propose the vote of thank. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, again, we have come to the end of this valuable discussion. So Dr. Faulkner, sir, I would like to express my sincere gratitude on behalf of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Sri Jayawardhanapura for your valuable participation as the resource person to mark the success of our international guest lecture uh, series. And also I would like to mention that as the FGS, you always have our support. And also there is a, a PhD position for a student for your, uh, this uh, ongoing project. And uh, so we hope to meet you soon for a serious discussion at our university. And uh, also Senior Professor Padmalal Manage, Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Sri Jayawardhanapura. Thank you very much, sir, for your valuable guidance. Uh, and Dr. Oshan Vedage from the Department of Archaeology, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Sri Jayawardhanapura. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your support in accomplishing this event a success. Mr. Atik and Mr. Kavisha, thank you very much for your uh, contribution. And finally, I would like to thank all the participants who joined us virtually through Zoom and YouTube. So here we conclude our session until we meet with you with another prominent academic figure in near future. Thank you again and have a great day. Goodbye. <laughs>